Um, today's webinar is going to be about um, a portion of what is entailed with full arch immediate load. And what we're going to talk about today is the patient workup and then the associated treatment planning that goes on with that. Now, there's a whole lot that goes into um, full arch immediate load cases, but this is sort of the uh, beginning stage of that type of treatment. You know, we're not going to go into um, surgery and immediate provisionalization. Uh, we're not going to talk about final steps. All that stuff is obviously very important, but when it comes to setting up the case, you really have to think about it in the right way. And if you start things off in the wrong on the wrong foot, then oftentimes you can end up with uh, a lot of problems later on. So this is kind of the way that um, I work with my team and how we try and set things up. Um, another uh, thing to consider here is I'm gonna be talking about a specifically analog approach. I'm not gonna get into a lot of digital planning and the reason that is, is because a lot of people don't have digital software. And it's also kind of like the baseline of where our understanding comes from. Digital dentistry is amazing. You can have awesome tools, but the concepts are really the most important thing. So um, utilizing those concepts uh, with digital dentistry is great, but it can be done with analog as well. And so we're gonna talk about mainly just the analog approach. Um, so let's kind of get started here. So, you know, when we look at this, we're looking at these types of patients and we're talking about what types of transformations that can occur. And in order to be successful with that transformation, you have to be predictable in your setup and your approach. And we can take a patient like this who's debilitated and, and really is, you know, suffering in his life and give him something that's much more successful for him. You can see that the life, you know, has been brought back to him and, you know, he's a much more fulfilled person ready to take on the things in his life that he needs to. And this is the type of predictability that we're searching for um, when we're going to set up our cases. So when we're going through this treatment planning sequence, the first thing that we need to do is acquire all of the information. So we're gonna go through that and what things you need to um, take with you to give to your lab or to do your digital planning. Either way, uh, you need to capture all of the data in order to start your plan. Once you've done that, we need to assess the F point. And the F point is the intersection between the maxillary midline and the central incisal edges. So that point is where we start all of our full mouth reconstructions. And this is the same thing that you would do for a patient who has an existing dentition. Um, this isn't me, like I didn't make this up. This is, you know, there are a lot of aesthetic uh, dental gurus who, who point to this as their starting point. You know, Frank Spear, Kois, um, a lot of orthodontists talk about this. And the F point also is when you're making the fricative sounds, you know, you want to hear that F on the vermilion border of the lower lip. And that's when you can verify and uh, make sure that you have that F point in the right position. So the F point allows us to get the correct fricative sounds. And that's also going to be affected by the um, facial palatal position of the um, buccal surface of the maxillary anterior teeth as well. So from the F point, then we need to determine how much restorative space we need. And when it comes to doing full arch immediate load, there are specific requirements that we need. And we're gonna talk about a universal requirement. Although lots of different materials exist in the market, um, it's nice to have one measurement that you can use to, um, to be able to encapsulate all of those different materials. Um, and we're gonna talk about that. And then once you've determined how much restorative space you need, restorative space is gained by doing uh, bone reduction. And once bone reduction occurs, then from that point, you can determine how much AP spread you're gonna have. So this is kind of like a flow. Like we start out with the F point. From the F point, we know how much restorative space we need. Once we reduce the amount of bone we need to that restorative space number, then we can determine what the AP spread is gonna be. And if the AP spread is correct, then we can go ahead and create the correct treatment options. So whenever you see a patient for full arch immediate load, you should never promise them right off the bat that they're going to be getting you know, a hybrid prosthesis. It's very important to analyze, especially the CT scan, 
to look and see, okay, am I going to have enough AP spread to allow for something that's going to be fixed? If the spread is going to be very poor, and this oftentimes happens in the mandible as well, in a square-shaped mandible, if the spread is going to be poor and the distal extensions of the cantilevers will be extremely long, then the patient might be a better fit if they were going to do some type of uh, removable overdenture on implants as opposed to doing um, full arch fixed. So there are limitations to uh, a hybrid treatment and it's really important to analyze that before you get into it with the patient uh, at the time of surgery. So for our patient workup, every time you see a patient, you wanna do a full new patient examination. Um, this is very important for medical legal reasons. If you uh, have a patient who's dissatisfied they decide at some point in time that they're going to take you to court. If you don't have a new patient examination where you've taken in all the information and written everything out clearly, um, it's, it's a very problematic situation if you don't have all that information. So doing a full new patient examination is very important. Um, and that includes details such as you know, vertical dimension measurements, um, existing teeth positions, you know, all the things that you would need to um, note uh, in terms of where you're planning on going with the teeth and the existing condition of those teeth. So uh, probe depths, everything that we would want to have. Um, and that is a very important part of the planning process. Uh, you always want to review the medical history. This is extremely important, especially if you are doing the surgery yourself. Um, this is a vital thing to obviously be prepared for anytime someone goes into surgery. Now, we want to make sure we have digital or alginate impressions that are overextended, meaning we're capturing all of the anatomic landmarks. So in the maxilla, we're going to be looking for, uh, you know, the hamular notch, we're going to be looking for those tuberosities, obviously, the, the palate all the way onto the soft palate, and then the extensions up into the vestibule, it's really important that we capture all that so that our laboratory has all the information that they need in order to fabricate uh, the temporary prosthesis that's going to be used for the patient. Uh, in the mandible, it's the same thing. We would want retromolar pads. We need a nice floor of mouth. So we need to capture everything um, without having anything cut off or any um, poor data. Uh, we would want to make a jaw relation record or an orientation record. Um, that's very important for us uh, to make sure that we have everything uh, the lab needs in order to set the occlusal plane correctly. And then taking intraoral and extraoral photographs is extremely important. We oftentimes overlook this, um, but for all of our cases, especially for full arch cases, those cases that are more, more expensive, and then oftentimes, uh, once again, if patients are dissatisfied, um, they need to have records of what they looked like before surgery. So if you didn't take any photographs, you're really shooting yourself in the foot because you don't have the information that you need to protect yourself. Uh, most of these patients have a pretty poor dental condition. And so a CT scan and um, photographs can really show you exactly what's going on. So some of the medical history, obviously patients with cardiac issues, issues with healing, smoking, uh, is a risk factor. It's not a contraindication. I see a lot of smokers when it comes to this. Um, probably 50% of the patients that I see are smokers. And we don't see a ton of difference in terms of success rates with smokers than we do with non-smokers. Diabetes is probably the number one complication that we have. Patients who uh, do not report that they have diabetes, but then you find out later on that they actually are diabetic. These are the ones that have the largest failure rates. So if you see a patient and they have not had a um, physical workup in you know, a year or two years, you want to make sure you send that patient to the physician, get a full workup and a blood panel as well, because you want to make sure that that patient is not diabetic. Um, these patients, you know, typically, if you didn't diagnose diabetes, patient comes in, say, two months after the implants have been placed, asks you, hey, doctor, is this the way it should be? And has you know, full arch in their hand with four implants that are sitting in the teeth, you know, and that's not the type of thing that we want to see. And I've had that happen before. I used to work at Clear Choice for a number of years, and we had a lot of patients coming through there. And sometimes uh, early on, the surgical uh, 
uh, support wasn't as good as I would have liked. And we had patients who, you know, weren't diagnosed with diabetes and some of that stuff actually happens. So you got to be careful. Osteoporosis and bisphosphonates, obviously these are things that we need to worry about. Typically in my practice, um, we will do surgery on patients who are on oral bisphosphonates, but if they are on infusions, um, typically we won't do the surgery. So here's an example of uh, the photographs that we want to take. So this is just like any you know presentation type photographs you would take. This is what we would do if we're going to do an Invisalign um, workup. You know we basically have our occlusal shots. We're going to take lateral views and a frontal view. So all simple. But once again, if this patient goes uh, to the judge and says, "Hey, my teeth were perfect, and Dr. Ferrier totally destroyed them," then obviously. Uh, that patient doesn't have a leg to stand on. So it's important to have this for your own records for the laboratory, but also for medical legal purposes. Now, here's the most important photographs. These extra oral photographs are the ones that are the most important. And if we take a look at this photograph, we're analyzing his face. If you look at the mid face and the lower face here, we're taking a look to see if the patient is strained. If the patient looks pretty uh, normal, like he does here, you can say, okay, his vertical dimension of occlusion is probably in the right spot. So we're in a pretty close position. Now, obviously, we're not making an exact measurement, but this does give us a very good uh, sense of where this patient is. If the lips look very strained, or if the curves at the uh, edges of the lips were um, drooping down, then perhaps that patient would be closed. And like I said, if he's stressed, then that patient might be open. But that gives us a sense of what's going on because. When it comes to full arch immediate load, probably the number one problem that we get ourselves into is the vertical dimension. If the vertical dimension is too open, that's probably the worst issue that we can have when it comes to this. You know, adjusting the occlusion, dealing with the aesthetics, all that stuff is pretty straightforward. And occlusion is nice because once again, we're dealing with a splinted restoration. So the arch will actually um, be able to uh, distribute forces over the whole arch as opposed to taking it on one tooth. So the occlusion itself is a little more forgiving than it would be on like a natural dentition. Um, but the bottom line is, as long as you don't open the vertical too much, most of the time things fall into place. A closed vertical is not great, but not as bad as an open vertical. So in this case, we look at this patient's vertical, the vertical looks to be um, in the right spot. If we look at the, on the right side, the nasal labial angle, that lip looks pretty well supported. So that's good. So we know that the facial portion of eight and nine are probably well positioned. So in general, this patient looks like they're pretty well set up for us in terms of our workup. Now, if we look at this patient and the patient opens and we have the patient in slight repose, you can see on the left side here, you can see about a millimeter of tooth just poking under the lip. That's ideal. And that's where we're sort of uh, starting to evaluate that F point. So I can see his midline, I can see his incisal edge, they line up in the philtrum of the lip there. So that's all where we want it to be. And if we look at the right side, everything looks appropriate there too. So in this patient, if we're assessing his F point just by the pictures, his F point looks pretty good from where we're standing. Now, here's a picture of this patient, and this is typically what we call the snarl photo. We don't call this the smile photo. The reason we call it the snarl photo is if you ask this patient to smile, he's going to give you something like this. So he's not going to smile for you because he's embarrassed and he hasn't smiled in years. But if you say, give me a snarl, like a huge snarl, like you're trying to scare a tiger in the jungle that's coming after you to eat you, then he'll give you something like this. So it's really important that you find the maximum position of the lip um, because you need to hide the junction of the prosthesis and the implants above that position. So this is a very, very important photo. You need to measure this position so that when it comes time to creating your surgical guide, that you're incorporating that into um, the space requirements necessary. So it's not just for the materials, but it's also for the aesthetics. So we wanna measure the lip at the maximum snarl position. We're gonna look at the maxillary midline and the central incisal edge, that's our F point there. And then the mandibular teeth are always based on the maxillary tooth positions. 
So we're really looking at how to hide the junction of the prosthesis and the natural tissue. And where we're gonna hide that is gonna determine how much bone reduction we need to do. So here's an example of that patient. This is the snarl photo. There's our F point front and center. So we have that the maxillary midline uh, between eight and nine, and then we have that central incisal edge position. So right at that F point, that's where we're starting to evaluate things. So if we look at the um, height from that incisal edge up to where the lip is, typically that might be anywhere from like 11 millimeters, maybe it's 12 millimeters, give or take. But that's not where we want to put our implants. We have to bury our implants further up. So we need to basically have at least three millimeters above that lip is where we're going to have the junction of our implants and our prosthesis. So it's very important that we hide this junction. If you are uh, a surgeon, it's your responsibility to look at this at the time of surgery and make sure you are going to be able to hide those implants. And if you're a restorative dentist and you are creating a workup for a surgical specialist, it's your responsibility to make sure that that's been incorporated in your surgical guide because that information is crucial and needs to be translated from your workup into the uh, surgical application. So here's an example. You know, Dr. Bedrosian is one of these guys who's been doing all on fours for many, many years. He wrote uh, a, a nice little piece for Nobel a long time back. And one of the things that he described was, if you look at this patient on the left, the patient has a very low lip line. That little green dotted line there is where the implants are positioned. And the red dotted line is where the lip is. So you can see the lip covers nicely the implants. When the patient smiles, everything's very aesthetic and there are no problems. If we look on the right side here, that lip is once again represented by the red dotted line and the green dotted line represents where the implants are positioned. So if somebody has not taken into consideration the mobility of the lip and the lip is above where those implants are, that's uh, a huge problem. And that's one of the things that can get you into a lot of trouble with full arch immediate load. Uh, that can result in a lawsuit. That could mean that you have to take out your implants and replace the implants. Um, and there's really no uh, coming back from that because in order to hide the junction of those implants and the prosthesis, if you have a high lip line like that, the only thing you can do is put a flange on a prosthesis. And if you put a flange on a hybrid prosthesis, that is not cleansable. And you're basically um, going to doom those implants to failure because you can't keep it clean. So putting a flange on a hybrid prosthesis is a huge no-no. We never want to do that. Um, so keeping those implants above the lip is crucial in order to not have to do that. So restorative space is achieved with bone reduction. And we want to make sure we have enough prosthetic room in order to have success. I see so many cases that I have to redo because the prosthesis doesn't have enough room and it's because the implants were placed without any bone reduction. So in any time you are doing a hybrid prosthesis, you always need to do bone reduction. It's automatic. Even in a case where a patient has no teeth and has been edentulous, oftentimes that ridge is a knife edge ridge or it hasn't been flattened. So oftentimes you have to do at least, you know, three to five millimeters of bone reduction, even if there are no teeth involved. So in every single case that you do uh, for a hybrid prosthesis, you have to have bone reduction done. It's really crucial. Your restorative prosthesis needs to be a minimum of 15 millimeters. Um, and that's from the implant fixture to the incisal edge of the occlusal plane. Your prosthesis has to be uniform all the way around the arch. It doesn't thin out in the posterior. You need to make sure it's thick all the way across. Um, and this allows you to use any type of material that you want. You know, oftentimes people say, well, I don't need to do bone reduction because I can, you know, get away with only using 10 millimeters for my zirconia. And that may be the case in terms of the strength of zirconia. But if you do that, then oftentimes you are not hiding the junction of those implants and the prosthesis. So you may have enough room for strength, but you don't have enough room for aesthetics. So 15 is an average number. It's not always the case, but that number is pretty typical when we're trying to have enough restorative strength and we're also trying to hide the implants underneath the lip. So in general, 15 millimeters is what we're looking for. 
If the patient has a really high lip line, you're probably going to need more. So you would have a minimum that's maybe 18 or 20, uh, depending on how high the lip line is. So it's important to understand that this is a minimum. It's not the only number. It's just the starting point. So we can determine this by looking at the CT scan and the extra oral photographs. So we're not merging files here. We're just saying, okay, on the extra oral photographs, how far up does that lip go? And then how much do we have to accommodate that when we look at the CT for bone reduction? So if you look at this patient on the left, she likes the amount of incisal edge display that she's showing. So if we look at the right, when she smiles, she has um, some gingival excess that we can see here. So we know that we're gonna to need to do bone reduction because we know that the, the gingival tissue always follows the bone and is close behind. So if we can see gingiva, we know we have to do bone reduction. Now, if we look at this on the CT scan, if we're looking at this from a lateral shot here, if we know her incisal edge position is correct because she said she likes how much she shows, then we can go ahead and we can draw 15 millimeters from that mark. So 15 millimeters is going to be the minimum amount of um, restorative space that we need. In her case, her lip line was not that high. So 15 millimeters is adequate for us to hide the implant and prosthesis junction beneath her lip. So that's a good number for us. So I can just draw this line on my CT scan and then I can draw a line on the palatal crest of bone. And this gives me a sense of how much bone I have. And then if I look at the difference between those two, that red line indicates how much bone reduction I need to do. So in a case like this, let's say the patient had a very high lip line. If the patient had a very high lip line, then that number needs to go up. Let's say it needs to go up to 18 or 20. Obviously, if that number goes up, then the red line increases in length and the amount of bone reduction increases as well. So it's important to understand, once again, this is all dictated by one, the amount of restorative space, but then two by the aesthetics in terms of how we hide the junction of the implants and the prosthesis. Now we need to make sure that we have a good amount of bone to place our implants. 10 millimeters is not a uh, hard, hard um, stop in terms of a minimum, but you wanna stay somewhere around 10 millimeters if you can. You know, you can tilt implants in any direction. So let's say there's only five, eight millimeters, give or take a vertical height. Well, you could always angle your implant to make sure you can get a 10 millimeter implant in there. But going below 10 millimeters, especially in the maxilla, is usually not such a good idea. So we try and always make sure we have at least a 10 millimeter implant um, if we can. So you can see on the picture on the right, that's the red line that represents the amount of bone reduction we would do. And we would reduce basically sinus to sinus. So here's, here's how we would set up a guide for that bone reduction. This is once again, just an analog approach. You could easily do this on um, a computer with a scanner if you wanted to as well. This is, you know, either way works. But in this case, we did a jaw relation record on the right side here physically. Uh, if you did a jaw relation record with this case, you would still have to have some type of wax rims because the patient has no tooth to tooth stops. So in a case like this, you still have to get analog uh, and denture patients as well you can't just scan and then do a jaw relation record because there's no, once again, tooth to tooth stops or contact points. So some cases like this and denture cases, you have to set up with dentures regardless. And you wanna have that set up anyway because that gives you a better sense in terms of vertical dimension if you try something in the patient's mouth and you get a good feedback in terms of what things are gonna look like. So we make uh, an immediate set of dentures. You don't have to make dentures if you're going to do a digital scan and then perhaps send that to be milled in the lab and delivered the, the next day or later that day. But um, traditionally having an immediate set of dentures is um, a good way to go. Uh, these are going to be milled. These are fully milled PMMA dentures. I always recommend that you get a fully milled uh, or you can have printed, but I still think milled PMMA is better. Printed can be a little bit brittle sometimes. Um, and I think that uh, the days of a traditional denture, you know, with packed acrylic and bonded denture teeth are over, those don't really work. You're going to have a lot of complications with teeth popping off and having other issues because dentures work with about one tenth the force of hybrid restorations that are set on implants. 
So it's no wonder that these older materials are going to fail and have problems for us. So to make a guide, this is just a very simple, easy way. You have a denture, you have a Lang duplicator, you stick your denture into alginate inside the Lang duplicator, you pour this up in clear ortho resin, and now you have a duplicate of your dentures uh, in clear ortho resin. That red line represents where we want to remove the flange. We're going to cut the flange off of this denture because that's where we're going to be able to score the bone in the mouth to be able to reduce bone to that level. If you see in here, you can see the red line and then the cast, or I'm sorry, the surgical guide is there and underneath the red line towards the incisal edges, you can see the cast that's there or what represents the bone. So that's how it would look in the mouth and you would score that with, um, you can just use a pencil and then cut that. This isn't a surgical course, we're just talking about a setup right now. So that's for another course. Um, if you're interested in that, you can always um, talk to me about that. I'm going to have an email that at the end of this course, we teach a live surgery course uh, that goes much more in depth into this. Um, and so if you're interested, you can always uh, hit me up for information about that. So here's what it looks like on the lingual. And on the lingual, we're not having this open window to place the implants. We're having this window to use multi-unit abutments to correct the angulation of the implants that are angled uh, in order for us to have screw access holes that come out of the uh, lingual of the teeth and not out of the facial. So here's an example. We have 30 millimeters of space we've created before we do our uh, immediate restorations. There she is to start and there she is to end. So she's doing pretty well after 10 days. Here's another example of a patient. Now this patient, we aren't doing bone reduction for aesthetics. She has a very low lip line. You can tell she's been hiding that thing for a long time. That's a big mess in her mouth, um, but obviously she needs something to be done. Her issue is that we actually have, um, we don't have enough restorative space on that right side, on the upper right side. So we need to do bone reduction to reduce that to give us enough restorative space. So once again, in this case, we're not looking at this from an aesthetic lens. We're looking at this and saying, I need to have enough restorative space. Um, so that's why in her case, we have to do bone reduction there. So we talked about restorative space and bone reduction. That's sort of the first pillar of having a successful full arch case. The second thing we have to talk about now is the AP spread. And the AP spread is the distance from the anterior implant to the posterior implant. And the key with this is the greater the AP spread, the less of a cantilever we have to have on our teeth. And so excessive cantilevers due to poor AP spread lead to excessive forces. And so if we have excessive forces on distal implants, that leads to implant failure over time. So we really wanna minimize cantilever lengths and we wanna try and have an ideal AP spread on every single case that we see. Now, does that happen all the time? Of course that doesn't happen but we always wanna shoot for it and we wanna be planning the way we can get the best AP spread possible. So here's an example of a study. You know, This study says that in the loading of the extension part of a prosthesis, there is a hinging effect which induces compressive force on the implants closest to the load and then a tensile force on other implants, meaning the implant right next to it. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So if we have this diagram here, if we have a um, 15 millimeter cantilever and there's 15 newtons of force in that first molar area, then if we have an implant at like the second premolar there, you can see it takes about 140 newtons of force and that's compressive force into the bone. That's a lot of force, but that's something that, you know, your bone can handle. But the implant in front of that, you'll notice has tensile force. It's actually being pulled out of the bone with 40 newtons of force. Tensile forces are not good. Your body doesn't like tensile forces. Compressive forces are good. This is like when you're standing up, your bones get compressed due to the, your weight and they get stimulated and that's what helps bone growth. So compression is good as long as it's not too much compression. So if we wanna try and minimize these forces, oh, and if you look at the, uh, on the left side there, those uh, magnitudes of forces are less than 10. So that's very minimal something that's almost negligible when it comes to this model. So if we wanna decrease those cantilevers, we can angle the implant. So when you angle the implant, notice 
the compressive force on the implant closest to the load is now 100 or 104. And then the tensile force on the implant next to that is only 13. So it's gone down to the magnitude of those implants on the lower left side. So we've really decreased everything and we have much more favorable forces now. And that all happened because we decreased the cantilever. So if we decrease the cantilever, we get more favorable forces, and then we're gonna have much more success over time. So if we look at this study, this study basically says that if we have distal cantilevers, if we angle an implant, or if we have a short distal implant, as long as they're at the same AP spread, the forces are similar. So because of that, that means I have the flexibility of having different implant conformations but you having the same force um, distributed in the system. So if we have this cantilever, we can try and minimize the cantilever and we can do that by tilting implants like this, or we could spread out more implants if we have the amount of bone we need necessary. But notice they have the same AP spread. That's the, the key here. Or we could have multiple implants and maybe two short distal implants. Now I'm not advocating having a large span with you know, six millimeter implants in the posterior, but in certain circumstances, if you don't have enough AP spread with your anterior implants, and let's say you're planning four, sometimes you can put a small implant posterior to the mental foramen to increase your AP spread. And that will allow you to load the system maybe on a day when you didn't think you're gonna be able to load because those anterior implants have a very poor spread. So this can be a very valuable way to either save implants. For instance, if you have an implant that doesn't have a lot of torque as your posterior implant, you can put in a, sh a short implant there. Oftentimes that can help um, to stabilize things, but it also allows us to have a lot more flexibility when we're trying to increase our AP spread. So, you know, we can have four implants, five implants, six implants. The number of implants do not matter. The key is the AP spread. So you need a minimum of four implants but you know, the amount of implants you have is based on anatomy and the need for support. So it's really not something that you have to plan every case to have four implants. Every case is unique and independent upon the situation that's being uh, presented. So you could plan something like this in the maxilla, say we had six implants, that's totally fine. You'll notice that there's a space in between each implant, like a pontic space. You always have to have that because if you put two implants right next to each other for a hybrid prosthesis, they will not be cleansable and those two implants will fail over time. I've seen it happen many, many times. I've done it myself over the years and it's something that creates a big problem and um, you gotta make sure that you leave, once again, a space enough for a tooth in there so that when a patient uses a water pick, they can clean and make sure that they get a cleansable prosthesis. So typically we can see a case like this, maybe where we have uh, individual tooth cantilevers. This is usually what we're shooting for is a one tooth cantilever. We don't wanna plan for any more than that if we can avoid it. Um, sometimes you see cases like this where we might have an implant in the first premolar and the lateral. And if you have that situation, that is not a favorable scenario. I've had situations where I've had an implant in the canine and an implant in the central, and obviously those cases aren't gonna work. So those cases aren't planned very well, and perhaps a second surgery is required in order to establish the proper AP spread. Here's an example of great AP spread. This is a Palo Mallow case. Um, obviously, first molar to lateral central is quite the spread, and that's something that uh, we should all be shooting for. In the mandible, we can have the same thing. I would say, in the mandible, probably 90% of my cases are four implants. Um, it's just more difficult to put an implant in the midline, especially um, when you're suturing, depending on your suture technique, you can do like a sling, a midline sling suture that could hold everything together. Um, and that's something we teach at our surgery course. Um, so, you know, in terms of that, typically we don't put an implant in the midline. Uh, also, uh, most of the time it's not necessary because it's actually not doing much to increase your AP spread. Um, so typically I'll put in more implants if it's going to increase my AP spread. If not, uh, I don't really need to use them. You know, Brandemark typically would put five implants intraforaminally. 
And um, that's not what we do these days. Typically, we're going to try and uh, angle our implants and place them with a little bit more AP spread. But the reason Brandemark would do this is because Brandemark had a lot of fully edentulous patients, and a lot of his patients had upper uh, complete dentures opposing a lower hybrid. And so he could get away with having this confirmation with a poor AP spread, even though um, we're saying that it's not a good idea uh, to do this. So he would um, do this sometimes, but like I said, in this day and age, especially against another hybrid or a natural dentition, um, this is not gonna work. Here's an example of a case that I did. So I don't always show great cases. I also show the real stuff that happens. You know, in this example here, you can appreciate that cantilever on the lower left side is huge. The AP spread there is, if we call that X, we're looking at a cantilever of maybe three X there. Um, and I did this because a patient uh, basically threatened to sue me if I wasn't gonna give them the teeth in the back there. So I made him sign this letter that said, you know, Dr. Ferrier is amazing. He makes no mistakes. It's all my fault if things fail. And the patient signed it, but you know, in the state of California, which is where I'm at, that doesn't really give you any privilege to go ahead and consent somebody to failure. Regardless, I felt a little bit better, but I thought that that cantilever was going to fracture and it was just going to, you know, be a total disaster. But that actually didn't happen. What happened is the uh, screw in front of that uh, posterior implant that got loose, and I tightened it down, and that got loose again, and I. Uh, tightened it and it broke and I replaced the screw and then it started cracking. And that's when I realized that this whole cantilever effect was occurring. So this is the, the hinging effect that we're seeing in real life. As you put force on that cantilever on the left, it hinges and then you see the prosthesis as it's actually fracturing uh, over time. So you'll see this if your cantilever is too far off. So in this case, we ended up just cutting the prosthesis off basically halfway through that molar to decrease the uh, cantilever. So a couple key concepts. You know, this is what people were doing, you know, 30 years ago to try and give somebody a fixed arch solution. You know, we don't see this many, many more, uh, many days these uh, during this time, but, you know, these types of things were an attempt to give people uh, something fixed. And that's what we're trying to do as well. This is what I call the Home Depot special. You get a bunch of drywall screws, you kind of throw them in there, you bend them, you connect them together. Um, this is another attempt that we uh, are staying away from these days. This is what I call the shotgun approach. This is an old approach that uh, we used to do in my residency program. The patient would go and see the oral surgery department. They would be uh, grafted with every graft possible. Uh, then the patients would get implants placed. The surgeons would kind of do the shotgun approach where they would like, you know, load up the shotgun and then explode a bunch of implants in there, pretty much as many possible implants as you can get in there. And then they would come and see me in the pros department and I would do a final impression and whatever implants stayed in the mouth and didn't come out in the impression were the ones that we actually used for our final prosthesis. So you can appreciate that the predictability of the situation was very limited. Um, and that's not the way we wanna try and do our dentistry. A couple of things that are interesting to note, if you look in the anterior mandible there, that is a lot of implants very close together. So you have six implants and they're all probably like two to three millimeters apart. I guarantee you this, this case was done uh, 12 years ago, maybe even more and um, I bet all those implants have failed at this point in time. So the idea that you need to spread out the implants is extremely important to get great success. And it's not the number of implants, once again, it's the AP spread of the implants. I can't stress that enough. More doesn't mean better. More can oftentimes be more complicated prosthetically, and it can be more of a hygiene nightmare. So spread appropriately with a good AP spread, that's gonna make your prosthesis successful over time. So here's an example. Typically what we do, tooth gets lost, we place an implant. Another tooth gets lost, we place an implant. And here's an example of a patient who went through that. This patient has a lot of periodontal disease. So the idea is how do you shift this patient into a fixed situation? Well, in this case, another dentist decided to take out the mandibular teeth and leave a premolar there, but 
provisionalize with a bunch of implants. And then in the maxilla, they're going to provisionalize and do some endo on some anterior teeth there and on a canine. So in this case, this is sort of a, a smorgasbord of different things going on here. But when they get to the end, you have fixed implants, you have crown and bridge on teeth, and you can appreciate the occlusal plane in the lower left is off. You have endo-treated teeth that eventually are probably, probably going to be lost and you're going to have to add more implants. So in reality, this probably is not a definitive solution. Whereas one of the approaches that you can take is if you just took out those teeth and in the maxilla put one implant in number eight, and in the mandible took out those teeth and put one implant in number 27, then you can basically do a hybrid. And so it's a very simple way to connect these teeth. It's important to understand though, that if you're going to do a hybrid connecting implants, they have to be placed deep into the bone. The reason it works in this case is because the patient already has periodontal disease and all these implants were placed with that in mind. So because of that, you can link these up. If a patient's had a tooth, uh, I'm sorry, an implant placed in association to the CEJ of, CEJ of healthy teeth, then you're not going to be able to use that implant because there won't be enough restorative space. So always think about that when you're thinking about adding implants to uh, older implants. This is a lot of implants. And that's even more. So we're trying to stay away from this. Once again, it's not more that's better. It's the AP spread that's better. So we're going to go over three cases here before we close. This is a case of a patient who is a good example of us wanting to do this case. Patient has a very low lip line. Patient has reasonable expectations. If you look at where the lip is positioned, if we look at our 15 millimeters here, if we go ahead and determine how much space we have to hide the junction of the prosthesis, that's 10 millimeters. That is tons of room for us to work with. So this is gonna be a very successful patient. So if we look at what the teeth look like before we do our treatment, we're not doing anything on the lower occlusal plane. So if we don't do anything on the lower occlusal plane, the upper teeth need to be the same basically. So they're not gonna change very much. So if we look at what the lower looks like, I'm sorry, if what the uh, pre-op uh, photo looks like, and then we look at what the post-op photo looks like, there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of the uh, alignment of the teeth. You'll notice that number 13 tooth, I, I did this to show that the laboratory sent me this back and they didn't actually do any changes or modification to the occlusal plane. They just gave me exactly what the patient had before. Eventually, I just took off that cusp and we were able to have the uh, prosthesis without any interference. But it's important to understand that not everybody's gonna be on board with what's going on and you have to tell your laboratory what to do. So I always like to show that picture. Now you notice in the lower left here, you can see the junction of the prosthesis and the multi-unit abutments, that little metal piece there. So I said that that's a no-no, but once again, her, lower, her lip is so low that that's not a problem. So I ended up opening that up because she was having a hard time cleaning in that area. A patient with a low lip line, we have the ability to do that. If the patient had a high lip line, there's no way we could do that. So there she is to start, there she is to end, and she's a happy camper. So here's a patient, his issue is a little bit different. He has severe perio. And when you look at his mouth, he has malaligned teeth, ill-positioned teeth, so we need to establish the correct F point and then hide those implants above his lip. So if we look at this, if we look at his incisal edge, that little black line represents where his incisal edge should go. So his F point is located right at that black line and where the midline position is, and that's where we're gonna reset all the teeth. Now, if you look very carefully in the midline, you can actually see the incisal edge of the mandibular teeth right there and there's some severe vertical overlap here. The patient probably has about 80% vertical overlap, and that vertical overlap needs to be taken into consideration. So when we're sending this to the laboratory, it's important to set this up the appropriate way. Part of the reason I like to have physical models is because sometimes it's easier to convey information uh, this way than it is on digital images. So there's where our correct incisal edge position needs to be. When the patient opens his mouth, if I were to describe the correct incisal edge position on the lower teeth, that's where it'd be located. So you can appreciate if I send this to the laboratory and say, just make some teeth, 
they might make the mandibular teeth at the same incisal edge position as his pre-op teeth. So we need to make sure they understand that those teeth need to be definitely reduced quite significantly where the incisal edge position is. Because where that incisal edge position will then dictate the bone reduction for the lower. So if you don't take into consideration changes in incisal edge position, that's going to affect the amount of bone reduction you have. And in, uh, in, as a result, also the amount of uh, prosthetic space that you have. So here's that example. This is where the super erupted lower teeth are located. This is where we want the correct incisal edge position to be located. So we go from that position and determine our bone reduction from there. So in this case, we have bone reduction going to that pink line. We have these uh, different shapes that represent the area of bone that is acceptable or available to us. And you can see where those implants are placed. Notice in the mandible, we have implants that are axial and they're posterior to the mental foramen. That is something we do all the time. There is no contraindication to doing that. And if you can have axial implants, it makes it a lot easier in terms of the restorative um, stage. So by all means, use axial implants if you can. And if you can achieve the same AP spread as doing angled implants, then I always recommend doing axial implants if possible. So there's where we start and there's where we end with this case. So here's our final case. This lady likes the incisal edge display. Her F point is good. So we know we wanna maintain that. But when she smiles, you can appreciate that she has some severe vertical maxillary excess and mandibular excess to that effect. Um, but this type of case is very challenging. So certain cases like this, you have to measure the amount of tooth, you have to measure the amount of gingiva, and you have to measure that three millimeter distance that we're trying to hide everything. And that's gonna tell us the amount of reduction that we need. So if this is three millimeters, and let's say those teeth are 10 millimeters tall, and let's say the lip is another 10 millimeters above that, that would be 23 millimeters of distance from the incisal edge all the way up to where the bone needs to be reduced. Most patients who have vertical maxillary access do not have this much bone. And so some of these patients are not candidates to do full arch immediate load. So anytime you see a patient early on, if they smile and you see this, you have to be very careful as to how you're going to assess and then treat the patient. Now notice in her case, if we look at where the apices of the teeth are, they're pretty far up there. And she has a lot of bone above the apices of the teeth. So even if we reduce all the way up there, we still have adequate bone. And the width of her bone is such that we can still place implants that are going to uh, exit the uh, maxilla coming out of the second premolar area. So she is very lucky that she has enough implants, uh, enough bone for us to place implants. So here she is, you can see we've angled implants in different directions, that's all good. Angle your implants any way you want to, multi-unit abutments allow us to take care of that. So here she is to start, there she is to end. And here she is, and there's her new smile. So that's what it looks like. Um, that's my email in case you have any follow-up questions or interest in um, any of the stuff we discussed. If you are more interested in an in-depth uh, live surgery course, I do teach that um, three times a year in Providence, Rhode Island, and then three times in um, Southern California, either Long Beach or San Diego. And um, we do a two-day course, live surgery, and then basically going over all the steps from the beginning of the process all the way through the consultation and then to final restorations. Um, so let me go ahead and, and check out the questions here. How much is the torque value on each implant? So typically when we place those implants, we want to have 30 Newton centimeters of torque. If you have a lot of, let's say we had four implants and let's say one of my anterior implants has less torque. Let's say it has 20 Newton centimeters of torque. As long as it's surrounded by two implants that have 30 Newton centimeters of torque, you can go ahead and load that case. But if I have an implant at say number four and it has 15 Newton centimeters of torque, we do not wanna load a case like that. So you gotta make sure that you have strong implants surrounding implants that are questionable. And that's one of the reasons why we use these little short implants is because let's say I'm in number 29 and we place an implant and we only get 15 Newton centimeters of torque. If that's the case, 
then we can place another short implant, even if the implant doesn't have great torque, let's say it also has 20 Newtons, that's 20 Newtons more to protect the implant in front. So I'll load a case like that if we can add up the torque and have a little bit more protection than just having one posterior implant with that much torque. So in general, the answer is 30 Newtons centimeters of torque. Uh, how often do fully milled dentures supported by implants break? Okay, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, if you are doing a provisional prosthesis and it's a fully milled PMMA denture and it hasn't been created with adequate thickness or strength, then that can fracture over time. If you're going to make a temporary, like an analog temporary, where you're doing this in the conventional way, if you have an immediate denture that's fully milled PMMA, you drill holes, you pick up cylinders, when you trim it back, you have to make sure that you leave it very thick. If you don't leave it thick and you make it very slim and streamlined for the patient's comfort, then they'll break and it's a nightmare. So one of the things you always wanna do is make sure your temporary prosthesis is not tremendously comfortable, is thick, it doesn't look great because then that sex sets the expectations really low for the patient. In terms of a fully milled denture supported by implants, I'm not sure if there's another type that they're talking about, but typically zirconia, um, zirconia is a pretty stable material. So I'll, I'll go to the next one. Can you review how to, can you review how to clinically measure the incisal edge to the lip line? Okay, so that's pretty easy. If you have a perio probe, you just go ahead and take your perio probe and go from the incisal edge up to the lip and figure out what that number is. Um, so it's it's a really simple measurement. It's not not too complicated. And then how is this communicated to the lab? You can either draw on the cast, which is probably the easiest thing to do, or you can take a photo. So you you have the perio probe. It goes up to the lip. You take a photo and then you send it to the laboratory. Uh, can ISQ readings replace torque values? No. Uh, and ISQ values are a little deceiving. Um, sometimes it's great when you place it and it shows a good level, but um, I think the real way to torque test an implant to see if it has good torque is to, um, after three months, once it has integrated, to reverse torque it to 30 Newton centimeters. If you can reverse torque the implant, then you know that it's torqued. ISQs at the time of placement, I mean, that's helpful. I think that that gives you a little bit more sense in terms of how um, stable the implant is, but we don't use them on a regular basis. The, the milled prosthesis, so the temporary prosthesis that you're going to use is a fully milled PMMA denture. Now, the benefit of that is it's all one piece. So if you're doing an analog pickup of the uh, prosthesis, there's no denture teeth that are going to come off. It's not, it's not going to fracture. The teeth aren't going to pop off. And that's because it's all made of one piece. So it's a very like strong, fully milled PMMA. You can have a printed PMMA also, but the printed one's a little bit harder to work with. It's like harder to... Um, to adjust, and it's also more brittle. So that's a little bit more problematic. Um, this type of denture can be um, gotten from like a, uh, Ovident is a, a denture company that does this fully milled PMMA. Um, and they're located in Phoenix. They're a good example of this type of situation. The minimum implant length, um, I would recommend that 10 millimeters is the minimum implant length for our regular implants. If you are using a short implant, probably a seven millimeter implant, something like that. Um, but only use short implants if it's in conjunction with longer implants. You never want to use just short implants all alone. That's not going to work. Uh, what do you think of implant fixed prosthesis with a natural tooth teeth in between two or more implants? Well, one of one of the biggest challenges between natural teeth and implants is the aesthetics. It's very challenging to get the aesthetics to look right, um, especially in situations where the um, periodontium is not ideal. So if a patient has any sort of bone loss or if there's a malalignment of teeth, oftentimes that doesn't work. So part of the beauty of having a hybrid restoration is you can control everything. So you can make everything look good, you can make it function and um, be hygienic. So it's really a benefit when you're trying to do uh, 
full arch implant dentistry. So that's, I would say it's, it's much easier doing it this way and you get more predictable results. Do you recommend if there's no periodontal issue? I'd have to, you know, those types of cases are sort of on a case by case basis, whether we're doing implants with natural teeth. If you have more implants than natural teeth, oftentimes we might uh, sacrifice a few natural teeth to be able to just do things on implants. So it really just depends on the case. If you have more implants than teeth, obviously we're not doing full arch. So that's a whole different situation. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending. I appreciate it.